Joseph. Hey, what's up with you, Beth? How are you? Fine. <laughs> Good to hear from you again after all these years. It's been a long time. Yeah, I remember it. I uh, yeah, had a nice uh, little chat there at the Cincinnati Jail. Yeah, that's right. 1998. Talk- October 21st, yeah. 1998. Was it October 21st? Yep. Yeah. That was the day the trial ended. Yeah. Oh, so you kept you kept track of that then, huh? I did. Oh, yes. And yeah. I kept track of you, and you sent me yeah. a letter. Oh, listen, before we um, go further, I just want you to know, and I want to make sure you're okay with yeah. my recording this. Is that okay? Not a problem. Hey, any time you want to record it, not, it doesn't matter. Okay, it great. Doesn't me. Great. I'm used to it, you know. Yes, uh, you had an interview today, earlier today, right? Yeah, I got the one with CNN. They sent some uh, Oriental girl. Uh, to interview me. I forget her name now, how she pronounced it, but she was real nice. I enjoyed that conversation. Yeah, good. How long did that uh, last? Huh? How long did that last? Uh, about an hour, I think, they gave us. I think that's usually the, uh, the you know, the uh, maximum you can talk to a reporter in one day. Right. But it was nice to be able to get my side of the story out, you know, when she asked me some questions and all, and let her know what I'm thinking. You know what I mean? Good. Good. And I just hope it would be great if she aired the entire one-hour interview and let the whole world see that. And you know, you know what I mean. It would really. Do you, you think know, they'll help, do help. that? Huh? Do you think they'll do that? I don't really know how they work it. I've never, uh, you know, I haven't been able to watch TV the whole time I've been in Missouri the whole 16 years. Wow. So I haven't seen any interviews. All these TV shows that everybody. It's watched. I've read about them in magazines and newspapers, but never watched any of them, you know. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of odd, you know, not, you know, going that long, 16 years without watching TV. But, you know, some people, you know, like the Amish voluntarily never watch TV in their whole life, so, you know. You know, I used to tell people I'm on TV, I don't watch TV. I do watch it, but I go days yeah. without turning it on. Yeah, I don't blame you because... It's better. Some people just become hypnotized by it, you know. Right. uh, It's better. This has kind of forced me to, uh, you know, made me want, you know, start reading books more, you know, books, magazines, newspapers, newsletters, or whatever. And so I've uh, become much more, you know, more educated than I was, better educated than I would have if I'd have watched TV, you know. Right. Because with reading, you can, if there's something you want to remember or certain uh, statement or whatever phrase, you can write it down and study it later. With and that's you know one of my something I often do is jot down, take notes from you know books and stuff that I read. If I find something like really profound, you know, right, and put it in my notes, and then I can go study it later and you know try to memorize it. That's a good way to memorize Bible verses too. Write them down and then study them. You know, read them over and over again. Right. Day. Right. Yes, uh, so let me ask you, um, right. just because I now have this opportunity one-on-one to actually, you know, once again, yeah. talk to right. you and just uh, understand you. Maybe yeah. you're not the same person today you were years ago, man, are you? I, man, I have grown and changed so much since I talked to you, Beth. You would not believe it if you were spent some time with me. You know what I mean? I've just become, you know, a different you know, I was thinking way back then, you know, this is interesting. When I was at the Cincinnati Jail, I thought, well, I've been locked up all these years. I've learned a lot. You know, I think I could, I could make it on the outside now, you know? Right. That showed you how little I knew back then. You know, how messed up my mind still was. Throughout the 90s, man, I just, I was just struggling over here, you know? And one thing is just is the solitary confinement, you know? It tends to... Uh, I found people who've been locked down for uh, many years in solitary confinement, you know, get kind of squirrely, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. They start acting odd. Well, how long (laughs) have you been in solitary? Well, probably longer than any inmate in the United States, close to 33 years. In solitary? Yeah, just about the whole time I've been in solitary confinement, probably more than any other inmate in the country. There's other inmates, you know, who've been incarcerated, you know, 33 years or longer, even longer than me, 40 years, 50 years, but that was not in solitary confinement. It's very likely in general population, you know what I mean? 
Right, so, right, right. It's, it's That's amazing. a long time. So, you know what I want to yeah. do? I really want to talk about the reason you're even there, because you have spent more time locked up than you were out, right? You were 30 when uh, you got locked up. Yeah, I was 30 when I got locked up. Yeah, that's right. I'm 63 now. So I'm actually, now that you mentioned, I've been locked up longer than I was out there. Yeah. Actually, a lot of my life out there, Beth, I never mentioned this to you before, but when I was a little, my mother used to make me and my brother stay inside all the time, you know, during mm-hmm. school. And I think it was the fact that she, you know, we had to wear long sleeve shirts and pants in the wintertime and shoes and socks, whereas... In the summertime, she would let us out with a pair of cut-off jeans and no shirt and no shoes or socks. You know what I mean? It, it oh. was pretty, you know, we were on, she lived in welfare of the project we lived there in Birdville. We were probably poorer than even the other poor people. Mm. I kid you not. I mean, I think that was her motivation, but she would not let us go out at all during school. We had to come home from school sit down on the couch and stay there watching TV until time to go to bed. Then we went to bed. Me and my brother Gordon could not go out and play ball with, with other boys, socialize. I think this stunted our mental development. He went crazy, and, that, and actually crazy, and my sister Carolyn had him put in a mental institution, the state the mental institution, uh, Bryce Hospital in Tuscaloosa, for several years, and he eventually got out and the last I heard was he was living in a group home in Panama City, Florida. So let me, let me ask you. So you say your mother was rather abusive. Yes. Yeah, do, do you think that's why you started killing people? Uh, yeah, let me give you Carolyn's number before I forget oh. it. Okay. Carolyn, right. okay. She, yeah. Both of them now, Lori, I talked to Lori a few days ago on the telephone. I talked to her Friday, right? Mm-hmm. It was the first conversation I've had with her since 2011. I got her number from a man who works for the Southern Poverty Law Center. In no Montgomery, kidding. Alabama. I kid you not, my friend. Southern Poverty Law Center. Yep, it's right there in Montgomery, Alabama. That attracts people who are like uh, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they got the hate uh, clan watch. Uh, yes, that's blog. right, like you. Yeah, like me, yeah. But you know what? I've been talking to uh, uh, the people there, and they're, they're pretty nice people, though. I like them, you know? I think they really they realized that I was mentally ill at the time, you know, and not responsible for what I was doing. You know, I was, you know, my mind was warped. Otherwise, I would have never committed those crimes. I realize now that I was wrong. You know what I mean? You do? You realize yeah. you were wrong about everything uh, you did? about every single crime, every law that I broke. It was wrong. Robin, from robbing banks to bombings to carrying out murders. Very wrong, you know. I've, you know, repented of my sins. Uh, asked the Lord for forgiveness. So, you know, I'm going from there. You hear me? Well, when did you first get, like, the urge to kill? Huh? When did you first get the urge to kill? <laughs> first get the urge to kill. You're the first person who's ever asked me that question. Really? Yeah. But see, here's what, let me tell you about an incident before I forget it. I was, I told you my mama was full-blooded German, right? Mm-hmm. Her parents were born in Germany. Both her mother and father were born there. Mama was born, though, in Jersey City, New Jersey, back in 1914, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, so anyway, I guess they settled for a little while in Germany before they went to Alabama and, you know, bought some land there and, and you know, uh, began farming. You know, they had cows and horses, I know that, and uh, had a pecan orchard and an apple tree and a pear tree and, uh, let's see, maybe I think some fig trees. And, you know, there were blackberries there where they could pick blackberries and make jelly and stuff out of them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, anyway, kind of living off the land, I guess you could call it. But Mama told me her mother used to beat her real bad. So she passed it along to us. And I think she was worse than, she had to be worse than her own mother on us. 
But she made me and Gordy stay in, sit on the couch. At first, me and Gordy didn't like sitting on the couch all the time. We wanted to go out with other boys and play ball. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like any normal of kid. Course. So we went to the, we would go to the bedroom where we both slept on a double bed. We would open this unlatch the screen and crawl out the window and go play. Find some, our friends to play with them, right? Mm-hmm. So to counter that, my mother wouldn't let us go into the bedroom anymore. Mm. So we had to stay right there in the uh, living room and sit on the couch, except when we wanted to go to the bathroom. And then she would watch to make sure we didn't sneak out of and go out the bedroom. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So to, to avoid that problem, to avoid that uh, uh, situation, I began bolting toward the door and unlocking it real quick. And running out. You hear me? Yep. So, you know, I just didn't hate it sitting in there all the time on the couch. All the time. She ev- evidently loved watching TV with her fat self and would sit there all night long watching TV thinking if she loved it so much, we must love it too. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, anyway, to keep us from running out the front door, she got Carolyn to sit up there and guard the door. So whenever I tried to run out the door, she would stand in front of me and stop me. You know, she was two years older than me. You know, Gordy was two years younger. Marilyn was seven years younger. But anyway, that prevented, you know, when you have to stay in like that all the time, your personality can't develop like other people, normal people, can can, uh, develop. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So... Couple of that with the uh, with the malnutrition, you know, of not getting any nutritious, very little nutritious food throughout my childhood, that can also affect your a person's a child's brain development. It pretty much warped my mind, and I was at least ten years behind every everybody else mentally. Mm. You know what I mean? Yep. I was just very immature. Didn't know, you know. Just, just didn't know what other kids knew. But anyway, uh, I had to, you know, endure getting beat up and yelled at all the time. She seemed to not want anybody to have a moment's peace. And my daddy told me one time that she would drop, uh, she would uh, call the police on him and have him arrested at the drop of a hat. So that's why he left her. Their divorce became final in 1965. But anyway... While I was at the Marion Federal Penitentiary during the 80s, that was before I met you, right? You met me in 98. Yeah, I know. But I said I was at the Marion Federal Penitentiary during the 80s before I met oh, you. Oh, you, you're making a fact. I thought you were asking me. Okay, yes. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, while I was there, I had a number of dreams, but one of them that uh, kind of stands out in my mind was one night I dreamed that I was told in a dream that I had killed my mother. You know? I wow. was told that I, yeah, I was, and I, consequently, I was guilty of matricide, you know, murdering your mother. Mm-hmm. And so, after thinking of that, uh, thinking about it for a while, the dream was basically telling me that all the crimes that I committed on the outside during that three year period I was on my you know, with, on, you know, committing those crimes, I was basically striking back at my mother. That was my way it was symbolizes me getting back at my mother, killing her for what she done to me. You, you hear me? Yes. So that's that's a long answer, but now I understand. You, that's yeah. your answer to my question, when did you get that first yeah. urge to kill? Yeah, but something the must have happened, like, in 1977, when, I mean, it didn't, you didn't start with killing. Your crimes didn't start with murder. Your crimes well, started with a bombing and with spraying an interracial couple with mace. I mean, what happened? Well, Why did you join the KKK and become a neo-Nazi? Why? Well, I became, uh, got involved with the, uh, the Nazi party long before I became involved with the Klan. As a matter of fact, it was, uh, it was 68 when I got involved with the American Nazi Party. You know, I was just 18 then. And I didn't get involved with the, become a member of the, well, first of all, let me say, I, 
became a member of another white supremacist organization based in Marietta, Georgia, called the National States Rights Party, which is most people in Georgia are familiar with, but not, you know, most people in the United States. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until 76 that I became a member of the Klan, and it was so infiltrated with FBI informants, I dropped out after a few months. Uh -huh. And what we were fooling with, there weren't very many genuine Klansmen. And as a matter of fact, I was watching a national, uh, I mean, a uh, 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 educational uh, doc documentary on, on the uh, uh, Corporation for Public Broadcasting. You know, that has this, you know, those programs that come on the front line and uh, yes. over. Yes, yes. Yeah, I used to watch that uh, channel all the time. And they had a documentary one night, and they mentioned a, a Clavern or a chapter of the Klan in South Carolina. And they said of all the members of that chapter of the Ku Klux Klan, only one of them was a legitimate Klansman. All the rest of them were informants for the FBI. No kidding. You know, yeah, I kid you not. And that's the type of thing going on now. Uh, the FBI has got them totally infiltrated, these the white uh, nationalist organizations. And uh, it's just, they pretty much, a lot of them, they, it's easy for them to influence those, you know, the races because all they got to do is use the word uh, hit the N word just one time, and they got those races bleed, uh, falling for it, hook, line, and sinker. They think just because they use that N word, uh, they're on their side. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. they, they don't suspect them of anything at all. As far as they're concerned, they're good people beyond reproach. So it's very easy for the FBI to infiltrate those organizations because the people are so so. So dumb and gullible, you know what I mean? But Joseph, you were different from all. For you, I mean, you were wanted to start a race war. Huh? You wanted to start a race war, right? Yeah, I want, yeah, I wanted to start a race war. That's my, that was my motivation, you know. And I got the idea from Charles Manson. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. Do you admire I, him or something? Huh? Do you admire? Well, Charles I used to I used to admire him, and that that was not uncommon. A lot of other people, members of the Nazi Party, admired him too, and other white, you know, organizations because they knew that he was against blacks and all that, and uh, you know, just they just liked the thing, like uh, the way he was trying to set up a you know uh, get a race war story. Well, maybe not that method because he was he he tried to do it by killing a bunch of whites. You know, even though they were rich, they were still whites. Mm -hmm. But and I try to do it, you know, the opposite way by by killing blacks, you know, or interracial couples. I took a different tack, you know, than him. And so, you know, but basically I was trying to do the same thing, hoping other white supremacists would see what I was doing and say, "Hey, look, let's go. We'll go do it too." And it, and, it, and it would happen so often that it would get a, a race war started. But it didn't work out that way. They weren't interested in copying me at the least bit. Most of them are all talk and no walk. You hear me? Yeah, and you I were, I mean, back. you kept this up from 77 to 80, and you were all yeah. over the country. I mean, I'm looking at where you were convicted, Wisconsin, Missouri, Tennessee, Ohio, Utah. But uh -huh. you claim that you murdered in other states as well. Those are just the states where you were convicted. Well, let me ask you before we talk further in detail about, you know, some, that crime spree. I want to ask you about one person in particular who's been, been very vocal lately, somebody you tried to kill and didn't. Yeah, Flint. Yes. Yeah. Why'd you do that? Uh, well, because, well, I was mentally ill, but I read, the reason I, I did it at the time was because uh, he was publishing pictures in the magazine and Hustler of uh, uh, mixed race couples. So I got really miffed at that and decided to kill him. You know, that's that's basically how it all started. But how did you but, find him? Well, it wasn't easy. I'll tell you. I went to Columbus, Ohio, and checked the city directory and found out that he lived in Bexley, a suburb of Columbus, and went to. A, uh, to the headquarters of Hustler on West Gay Street, and 
try to just, you know, just kind of case it to look, look around, see if I could find a place to shoot him. If he came out, there was an alley in the back that had a bunch of surveillance cameras in it. I mean, it was incredible how many surveillance cameras were in that alley in the back. I guess that's the entrance he used to the to the headquarters of Hustler. But anyway, it would have been hard to sh- get a shot at him from there. And then I found out that he went to uh, North Carolina and was staying at the home of Ruth Carter Stapleton, you know, Jimmy Carter's sister, who mm-hmm. was a fundamentalist Christian. And so I looked around, went, drove by her house, and nothing came of that. But then I happened to be in Atlanta in the uh, uh, early part of 78, and I saw on the news one day that Larry Flint would be tried in Lawrenceville. I was staying at a day's end there in Doraville, Georgia, suburb of Atlanta. So I thought, well, I'll check out of here, get a map, and find out where Lawrenceville is. Not knowing Lawrenceville was just a little ways up Highway 85. You hear me? Mm-hmm. So I went to locate it and found out it was just really close, close to Atlanta. So I checked into another motel, and then started going out there every day, looking around over in the in Lawrenceville, you know, at the courthouse there, looking for a place to ambush him. So that's how I finally caught up with him. You know, that there, there's a song called The Devil Went Down to Georgia. You remember that one by the Charlie Daniels band? And You're the Devil? No, I thought, no, I considered Larry Flint the devil. He went down to Georgia. I didn't. I would not go go down to Georgia. I was from Alabama. Got it. So it would have to apply to, to Larry Flint. So to me, that that was that symbolized. Charlie Daniels was singing about Larry Flint, as far as I was concerned back then. You know, I was very much into country and western at the time, listening to that song and others. You know. So but tell anyway, me. Well, tell me uh, about that day. I mean, you you were you were scouting the place out, looking for the yeah. right time. So, how did the right yeah. time come about? Uh, well, I read in the uh, in the papers I was keeping up, you know, with all the articles in the newspaper about the case, and uh, I got some very good information from one of the articles that said that Larry Flint would walk from the courthouse every day for lunch to the cafeteria. So, you know, I realized instantly that was some good news, some good intelligence. So I uh, waited till after, you know, the evening and went back up there and walked that route from the courthouse to the cafeteria, even went in there and ate when I was there. <laughs> you hear me? Yeah. We went to the cafeteria and ate a meal that evening. And so then I left and walked slowly back to the courthouse looking for a place to ambush it. So as luck would have it, there was an empty building right there before you get to the courthouse. So I went around and looked around. It was really, it evidently had been empty a long time. No screens on the window. It was just all, you know, dirty looking and boarded up. So I was able to get this board off the a two by four that had been nailed to the back porch off and opened the back door. And so I went into the back, you know, went into the back door and saw that there was a front door with, you know, window open with no glass there and figured, man, this would be the ideal place to ambush the, the man. You hear me? Mm-hmm. So anyway, I didn't want to be seen while I was standing there waiting for him. And sh- or just, and while I was shooting either, so I went and got one of these croaker sacks from somewhere. I forget where I got it. Bought some thumbtacks from a drugstore and hung it up over that little over the door of the window of the front door. You hear me? Mm-hmm. And so anyway, I got the rifle. So I didn't even have a gun to shoot with. To tell you the truth, I had to go look up an uh, advertisement in the paper and some. Gentleman in Douglasville, Georgia, had a 44 Magnum uh, Marlin for sale, lever action. So I went out there and looked at it. It looked pretty good. I bought the gun from him, went back, 
and uh, the trial, according to the media, had been scheduled to end Friday. For some reason, it, it was carried over to Monday. I took that opportunity to go there on that weekend and buy the rifle. Had it not been carried over to Monday, I would have never got it. You hear me? Because you didn't have a rifle. I didn't have a rifle to shoot with, you know. I can't even remember exactly what kind of gun I had, even if I had a pistol. I must have, I always wanted to try to keep a pistol on me, so I think I had a pistol, but I wouldn't have wanted to use my only, you know, handgun to, you know, for a shooting like that. I did not have a rifle. I had to go out there, and, you know, luckily I found that one, you know, came back, brought it to that vacant house, uh, went to one of the back bedrooms that had a, no window on it, and stuck it through the window and set it up against the wall. At that point in time, though, it slipped down, I thought, you know, and fell on the floor, you know. I should have been more careful when I set it against the wall from where I was standing outside the window. I thought maybe the scope would bro had broken or something, so I got it and checked it, but luckily it had not, you know, affected the rifle at all when it fell on the floor. So anyway, I went there, came back again, parked in the back, which was also the parking lot of a bank, you know, nearby. Went out there and waited, and uh, you know, I just uh, a bunch of secretaries walked by. I heard them talking and laughing, and you know, I was scared. I was really terrified, to tell you the truth, standing there. And then all of a sudden, I see two men coming from the left, from the direction of the cafeteria. So I, I thought I would plenty early enough to be there that he hadn't walked by yet. But evidently he had and was returning to the courthouse. So I thought, you know, there's a couple of men passing. I'll put the scope on the crosshairs on them and and follow them a little, you know, with it a little bit just for practice. You hear me? Mm -hmm. So anyway, I took the, picked up the 44 Magnum rifle, put the crosshairs on one of them, and immediately recognized him as being Larry Flint. Mm. Isn't that something? So you thought you were just going to sort of practice, and it was actually Larry. Yeah, man, it was just, it was <laughs> it was wild, you know. I mean, I'm thinking, here's there's a guy walking by. I'm just going to put the crosshairs on him for a minute, and you know, pretend like that's Larry Flint, and you know what you know what I'm talking about. And you fired. Just for a little practice, as soon as I recognized it was Larry, I pulled the trigger, you know. I racked the action real quick and pulled the trigger. Got him one time. The other guy, by the time I put, looked back through the scope again, the other man that was with him had disappeared. I couldn't see him. I heard later that he ran, got even though wounded, and uh, hid behind a the car. I then Larry Flint was leaning up against the... This call is from a correctional facility and may be monitored and recorded. Leaning up against the wall of somebody's yard, so I chambered another shell and shot him again and then ran out the back window. I mean, ran out the, the back door. You hear me? You only fired twice? I only fired twice. And yeah. you hit a man each time you fired? I hit, hit the man each time. He got, he got shot twice with a forty four Magnum and incredibly lived through it. How uh, far away were you? Uh, just, you know, just, he could just uh, visualize the street, you know, and then the front of a building that's sitting on that street, and then across the street. It wasn't very far at all. It was very, very close. I mean, I've, I could shoot much further than that and still be accurate, but... I wasn't really that great of a shot, you know, early in 78. I hadn't really had a lot of practice, you know, at that at that point in time. Well, that's pretty good. Two yeah. shots, you hit your target each time. How so, did you get away? Well, I, went, I, I had a large oversized pillowcase that I knew that rifle would fit into, so I stuck it into that pillowcase real quick. So in case anybody saw me running in the back in the parking lot with it, they wouldn't be alarmed. So anyway, as luck would have it, nobody was in the parking lot. You know, I 
been there a few times before and parked the car there and had seen people either getting into the cars or leaving, you know, either arriving or getting into their cars. But anyway, luckily nobody was in the parking lot. Nobody saw me get into my car until the rifle in there. So I also, as I was leaving, I heard some tires squealing. Almost as soon as I fired the second shot, I heard somebody peel out of there. You hear me? Mm -hmm. And so I found out later a couple of young young guys uh, were in the uh, Camaro, and they uh, when they heard the shots, I guess they scared them and thought somebody they thought somebody was shooting at them, so they peeled out of there. So when people witnesses come out and saw heard the shots and, and looked to see what was happening. They saw that Camaro leaving, peeling out of there, and thought they were the shooters. So they called the police and told them somebody had got shot, and two people uh, were seen leaving the scene at a high rate of speed in a Camaro. So they then began, uh, when the police got that information, they broadcast an alert all over for that Camaro while I was driving around in a, away in a Torino. <laughs> you hear me? Right. Nobody's that looking was, for you. Huh? Nobody's uh, looking what? for you. Yeah, nobody was looking for me, so I just took on off and uh, went back to my motel, got rid of the gun, cut it up into pieces so that they could never do any ballistics test on it. I forgot, it's been so many years ago, I actually forgot what I, where I threw the gun, but I would dismantle it with screwdrivers and stuff, cut the barrel in half with a, like, I first began using a pipe cutter uh, that plumbers use, you know, to cut that barrel in half, and then I bought a Black & Decker drill with a grinder on it and started using that uh, the Black & Decker drill to cut the barrel off. Because once you cut the barrel off of a gun, the police can no longer do any ballistics on it. All the lands and grooves on the inside are all messed up. You mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So anyway, I mean, they could, they could still, uh, if you were to chamber a gun, uh, I mean, if you were to eject a gun, uh, uh, a bullet from the gun after uh, empty shell after it's been fired, they could still match that uh, uh, the print on the, the mark on that shell to the firing pin. I guess you could probably avoid that though by taking a, a piece of sandpaper and scraping that firing pin for a little while. I've actually done that for one time too on a gun, so that uh, the marks that you that they found on the empty cartridge would not match then right. uh, the firing pin. So anyway, right. yeah. So anyway, I got rid of the gun so they could never, ever do any ballistics test and match that to me. You, you see what I'm saying? So that was March 6, 1978, and you went on right. to keep killing into the, well, well into 1980. So the rest of 78, yeah. 79, yeah. 80. Yep. But let me just ask you a couple more questions about Larry before asking you a few other things. Um at the time you shot him, did you think you killed him? Uh, I felt pretty sure. I, I was convinced that I killed him, yeah. So when you learned that he wasn't dead, yeah. rather he was paralyzed. Then I became upset and went to the hospital and started driving around the parking lot thinking maybe I could finish him off that way. Maybe you could what? Finish him off. Maybe, I don't know, I was thinking maybe actually going into the hospital room and blasting him with a pistol, you know, but, you know, that never panned out. I never really thought about it further after that. H how many times did you go circle the hospital? Just, just one time. I only went there one time and then I left. I figured it just, it, it just, it would be impossible to get another shot at it. So, I just left. So, what do you think was more impactful, uh, if you had killed him or having paralyzed him? Well, I didn't want the Hubster magazine published anymore. That was my goal. I did not want that magazine to be seen on any more newsstands. So that was basically my motivation for going after Flint. So, but I thought it was always because you saw an interracial couple in there. Was it that too? That that is that that is the reason why. I see. That's okay. the reason why I didn't want public. Uh, also published anymore. I see. It wasn't that you were anti-pornography. You were anti the interracial couple. Yeah, just the interracial stuff, yeah. 
as far as pornography in general, I really wasn't tripping on that. I mean, I had nothing against Hugh Hefner or uh, Bob uh, Guccione. Bob Guccione and the rest of. Them. As a matter of fact, I like Bob Guccione. I think you know he. I really like you know him and the magazine. And I really didn't have anything against Playboy either, for real. You know, Hugh Hefner either. So I don't know if you're aware of this, and maybe you are because you've given some other interviews to people, but recently yeah. Larry Flint wrote an article. Yeah. And let me read you three lines from the article. All right. It says, in all the years since the shooting, I have never come face to face with Franklin. I would right. love an hour in a room with him and a pair of wire cutters and pliers so I could inflict the same damage on him that he inflicted on me. But... I don't want to kill him, nor do I want to see him die. Yeah. What, what's well, your response I, to I that? Huh? What's your response to that? What do you have well, to say I to that? I appreciate the last part, you know, the last two things he just said. I just don't like the, you know, I really don't like the part about torturing me, though, for an hour, you know. Yeah. I mean, that would, wouldn't be, uh, I don't think it would do anybody any good. And for real... The, that is not the will of the Lord to 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 seek vengeance against us to seek vengeance against each other. You know, he he tells us in the Bible, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Say it he. So it's the Lord's it's the Lord who will be calling everybody to account on judgment day and making them pay for what they've done. You know, we should not ever try to, you know, uh seek vengeance against anybody, try to pay anybody back for what they've done. You know, it you know, if you when you keep on thinking about stuff like that, it actually hurts you, you know. And I think people should just forget about it. Uh forgive people f for what they've done because they've done things too to hurt people and they need forgiveness too for all their sins. So it isn't a good idea you know, that is one thing I can guarantee you. I would I would not like to torture anybody in this world. I don't care how bad they've done anything, how, you know, no matter what they've done, how bad they've been. I have no desire whatsoever in my heart to torture anybody. So I just... Just kill them. I mean, maybe not now, but in the past, yeah, just yeah, kill that's, them. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be the, the best thing right there, you know what I mean, if they really was so that vicious and evil. I mean, uh, I was reading, I heard about somebody in Columbia. Uh, I was in one of these classes that they were uh, making us take at the Tosi Correctional Center, and there was a little bit of news on. You know, I would go to that class, which lasted about an hour, and he just happened to have this TV on it in the classroom, and I don't know what it was, I think it was a news channel, but they had some a story about some man who murdered a 13-year-old girl. And I just thought to myself, I mean, that was absolutely outrageous. You know, and for more than a minute, I would have liked to kill the guy. You but know Joseph, what I mean? you killed a 13-year-old boy. I, that's the trial I covered. It wasn't a girl. He was a boy. 13 yeah, and 14, the cousins. You killed children, too. True. Yeah, I know. But here's the thing about it, uh, Beth. Uh, I, uh, I consider a boy a whole lot different from a girl, to tell you the truth. Not that that was the right thing to do. You know, I repented of that sin and realized I was wrong, too. But I was in a situation where I had just been to Detroit, Michigan, uh, the previous year. You know, I've, you know, gone up there uh, to buy a car. To tell you the truth, trying to buy a car real cheap. I've been told once that uh, you can get cars real cheap there. You know, because there are so many automobile manufacturers there that you could buy a used car there at a real cheap price. You know, real mm -hmm. cheap. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So while I was up there, you know, I, of course, kept up with the news, and there's a story in the paper about a little 11-year-old girl who, 
I'm pretty sure it was Wyatt. And she was walking to the store one day, and some young black boys, about 14 years of age, jumped on her and raped her and uh, strangled her and cut her with a knife and beat her in the head with something and left her on a trash pile moaning. Somebody came by and they found her, her moaning on this trash pile. And so I became so outraged about that, I guess it didn't really matter whether I hit teenagers or not. You know, I just, I'd heard so many, about so many rapes committed by black teenagers 16 years old, 16, 17, 18, 19, uh, Lives in Washington, D.C., the whole area, you know, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, for five and a half years altogether. They used to have a Youth Corrections Act there, and any crime committed by a juvenile, whether anything, even serious things like uh, rape, murder, whatever, were only punishable by a few years in, in a juvenile detention center. Once he became 21, he was automatically released. He could rape anybody he wanted to, kill anybody in Washington. And under this Youth Corrections Act, he could not spend any more, serve any time past his 21st birthday. So there I had met grown white women who had been raped by 16-year-old black guys. And it was just outrageous. And, you know, rape was kind of like an epic in epidemic proportions in Washington, D.C., with these young white women who would come from cities on the East Coast, uh, they would come get a job for the government. Uh, the blacks outnumbered whites, I think, in 70% in Washington, D.C. They would rape left and right, catch these young girls in their car. I met, I knew one of them. I actually met one, knew a black guy who told me he would wait in their car, have a credit card in his hand, yeah, a little plastic credit card. He would get it, sneak up behind them, stick it in their neck. They would think it was a knife, and he would rape them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, man, you know, it's just, I just heard so many cases over and over like that. And, you know, being from Alabama and not being used to a big city like that, to be all of a sudden exposed to that sort of situation and reading about the stuff in the newspapers and listening to it on the radio. And, you know, actually I didn't watch much TV then, but, you know, I would keep up with the news in the newspapers and I was just outraged, you know, and so... Well, let me, let me ask you this, then, if I'm hearing you, because I, 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 hear, I hear your words, does that mean that when you killed... These two cousins, these boys, uh -huh. black, 13 and 14, walking to the yeah. store after school in 1980. Uh, basically, you were killing them because you were angry that other black teens had raped white women? It, it shot and killed white men and robbed. These boys and, didn't do anything, but you were taking yeah, it, you were blaming them, sort of. Is that what you were doing? Yeah, I know. It, it, it was... It was idiotic what I was doing. I, you know, I figured that, you know, it was just something common among blacks, period, and I was taking out on random blacks, black men everywhere. Mm. I, I encountered them uh, for what other blacks had done to whites, and it, it was absolutely foolish. I was stupid to even think about doing that. I mean, those two guys, I, I mean, they was... I would have never even thought about doing that, harming them today. Uh, I mean, I, I would help them if they needed it, but I wouldn't even think about harming them. Uh, you know, now that I know what I, what I already know, I, I was just really crazy back then. I just mm -hmm. My mind was warped, or I would have never even uh, even thought about killing, mm -hmm. you know, young teenagers like that. I, I didn't know that they were quite that young. I thought maybe they were just... 17 or 18, I couldn't really tell, but... Yeah, you were far away. Like, Let me uh, ask you, I want, you were far away. You were up on the railroad trestle, remember? Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a, um, I have another and question. it was dark. It was, and it, and it it was, was about 10 o'clock at night. But, you know, uh, this is something uh, I never told anybody about before. But as they were walking 
my direction, you know, I was sitting there on the, you know, right there on this, on the other side of the railroad tracks where I had a view of the sidewalk there, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever looked over that area or not, but. I remember the area. I'm not sure I sat up where you were, but I remember the area. Uh-huh, yeah. A, you know, railroad track crossed over, and I was sitting on the, you know, was actually laying down or crouched by the railroad track. The, the first one, I hit the first one first with the rifle. It was a little 44. It happened, happened to be a 44 Magnum two, except it was a Ruger rifle. And uh, as soon as I fired the first shot that night, it was real quiet and still, by the way. But I hit the larger, the taller one first, and the second one bolted immediately. You hear me? Yes. He, I mean, he just started taking off real fast. You know, after hearing that rifle shot to my left, so I had no time to take the crosshairs and put it put it on him. You know, on a moving target like that. So I just swung the rifle to the left and fired a shot where I thought he might be. Incredibly, it hit him. I could not believe it. When I saw in the papers, I, I thought they must be lying. I could not have hit that second. Wow, man, that I did not know. Yeah, man, it was incredible. I mean, the, the fact, I mean, that I could just swing that gun up there and not even be looking at him, you know, I just didn't have time to get to look through that scope again. You know? I just fired out there, in the, out there in the dark, and it hit him. So, you know, it was just incredible that I got both of them that night. But anyway, mm. I later read in the papers that it had killed both of them, you know. That's how I found out about mm. it. And there you were in the daytime, pretty close, with Larry Flint and his lawyer, yeah. and both of them lived. Yeah, and both of them lived. Yeah, that, that was another thing, too, because, well, that, you know, both of them, I used the same caliber, uh, 44 Magnum on them. You're a pretty yeah. good shot, Joseph, for somebody who had, um, you, have, uh, you had issues with your eyes, your eyesight when you were young, right? I don't know how you're such a good shot. Yeah, I don't either, but, you know, I, I actually, well, actually, I do know. It just took practice. I couldn't hit the broad side of a barn when I started out, and the, the sound of the rifle, I began uh, practicing with a thirty out 6 That's even a little bit more powerful than a thirty thirty. But you know? I want to go back to Larry Flint. He said something else recently. Let me read you this statement. Again, maybe you've heard it, maybe not. Here's what he said recently. I find it totally absurd that a government that forbids killing is allowed to use that same crime as punishment. But until the death penalty is abolished, the public has a right to know the details about how the state plans to execute people on its behalf. Yeah. What do you think of that yeah. statement? Well, yeah, Larry is very idealistic. You know, I mean, I like to, I agree with him, you know, he says in his book that he's a big supporter of the ACLU and, uh, I agree with a lot of their uh, aims, too. You know, I just wish that they would have put more effort into, uh, in, into freeing those, uh, all those men they got on Gitmo who are being held there uh, without charges and due process of law. You know, just like a communist uh, country, I mean, it, it's outrageous that, that uh, this is supposed to be a democracy and we'd be holding somebody there without any charges or anything, have never been convicted of anything, sentencing those, those men, and they're innocent men, see, they're innocent until convicted in the court of law. They're holding innocent men in prison the rest of their life just because President uh, Bush declared them enemy combatants. Yeah, that, yeah, it's that a different right. system. You know, it's not the system that, that prosecuted you, but uh, it yeah. is still the, the United States. Let me ask you this. If you, one more question about Larry Flint. If you could speak to Larry Flint, if you could have that face-to-face -face conversation that you've yeah. never had, what would you say to him? Well, that's what the, CN, the lady from CNN asked me today, too. <laughs> you know? But, you know, what I've been, uh, uh, let's see. Well, how, how can I say this now? Uh, what, what I would like to to see them see Larry uh, do is come over here. You know, well, it might not be time now, but I wish he he could have come over there. You know, uh, 
uh, scheduled, you know, set up a media visit. He came over there to Potosi himself to interview me on camera, you know, and I would have got to talk to him there, even though it would have been through telephones and glass or while I was in full restraints. Uh, I think it would have been a good thing for us to meet, or it would, it still would be a good thing for us to meet face to face. Well, what would you and say? I, well, first of all, I would apologize to him, you know, and tell him I'm sorry, you know, I uh, ask for his forgiveness for the, the harm I caused to him. You know, I've repented of that sin. I realized now I was wrong. That was his business. You know, I was just, I just got too, uh, went crazy over nothing, you know. I mean, uh, I, I, it should be handled legally. You know, if I would have went to, didn't like it, I just could have maybe, uh, you know, not bought the magazine and, and encouraged others not to, but I still should have, should not have got that upset about it. You know, I should have tried working, only working within the system and not ever even think about breaking the law. I realize now that's a good thing, though, to always work within the system. I encourage everybody, anybody in, affiliated with any white nationalist organization, whether it's the uh, skinheads or the Klan, to always work within the system. You know, you're, it, 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 everything will work out a whole lot better that way. Violence is the worst thing you can do. It's just totally, you know, that's a really, totally a bad idea. Well, when did you come to that realization? How long did it take you? Man, it took me many, many years to think of this, to think a lot of things through. Man, it's just, you know, you would not believe that all the, how, you know, all the years I've had time to think about this and think these things through. And, you know, really this has turned out to be a blessing, you know, uh, in disguise, you know, you know, I thank the Lord that I got caught and before I could, you know, commit other crimes and for giving me this opportunity to, to, uh, change and become a much better person. You know what I mean? So I've had a great opportunity to change, you know, to grow and change. And, uh, if I'd have been out there on the streets working a regular job, it would have never occurred to me to try to become a better person. You have so much opposition when you're in prison with charges like mine. You know, I mean, people hate your guts like you would not believe. Guards, inmates, you know, I've had inmates, black inmates, cuss me out and threaten me. I Do you consider yourself times. a racist still? No, of course not. No, I ain't a racist, no. That, that is not right. It's a sin to be, hate somebody because they're raised, because God is the one who created people the color that they are. You know, and it, it's just wrong to hate somebody just because they're raised, because you'll find a lot of good people in other races. You know, you'll find people black who will help you out sometimes when whites won't. You know, I had to find this out since I've been incarcerated. And, uh, you know, it's not a good idea to hate somebody just because of their, their race. And I do meet occasionally inmates who are racist in here, and uh, it's just not a logical way of thinking, though, to tell you the truth. What about anti-Semitic? You're on death row because you killed somebody who's Jewish. Yeah, I'm pro-Semitic now, by the way. Pro-Semitic. Yeah, yeah, I was anti-Semitic, you know, but now I'm pro-Semitic. If you could turn the clock back, Joseph. That's a new word I just coined. Yeah, right, <laughs> pro-Semitic. If you could turn yeah. the clock back to 1976, yep. you haven't bombed any place, you yeah, haven't robbed any banks. I, mean, I, don't I, know. I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even think about breaking the law at that time. You know? you know, knowing what I know now, you know, of course I would not. I would know not, you know, not to you know, uh, break the law or try to harm anybody. But at the time I had very little knowledge, you know, so that's, I think that's that's key, the knowledge that you have, you know. I've learned so much over the years. I've been in solitary confinement. I've had the time to uh, do a whole lot of studying to, you know, try to uh, educate myself and improve my mind. I've probably spent more time studying than most university professors have spent studying. Plus, I've had a lot more time to think things through than they have. I'm, 
I can probably, uh, uh, I'm probably a better thinker, out of the box thinker than most, you know, professors and anybody else in this country. You know. Do you think so, that you were treated fairly by the system? You weren't prosecuted for all the crimes you say you committed, but you were yeah. prosecuted for eight killings. Uh-huh. You were prosecuted for shooting Vernon Jordan, but you were acquitted of that. Yeah, and that that goes to show you that a person who's guilty can be acquitted, uh, just like, conversely, a person who's innocent can be convicted. Yeah. That has happened, too. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, a, a finding of not guilty, Joseph, is, is, is not really a finding of innocence. It just means there's not enough proof. Yeah, there's not enough to convict you and to prove you're, you're guilty, even though you may be guilty. Now, and, but do you think that for the prosecutions you've had, trials and pleas, that you uh, were treated fairly? Uh, well, in which case, for example? Well, how about the case that landed you on death row? Uh, no, I don't think I was convicted. I didn't get a really, uh, I got a, it was, it was pretty. Fair. Not a fair trial? Uh, well, here's the thing. They were extenuating circumstances in one case. You know, I was, you know, I wound up at the Marion Federal Penitentiary. And, you know, as, as, as you know from reading, and other journalists know from reading the news, you know, you hear about a case in the news, the guy goes to trial, gets sentenced, life in prison, whatever, or I guess, you know, gets a death sentence. That's the last you hear of it, you know. So in my case, you know, I get, get tried in Utah, convicted in federal court and state court of first violation of civil rights and then state court of murder, sent to the Marion Federal Penitentiary, and... But then all of a sudden, I have to wind up confessing to this, get extradited over here, uh, try it again uh, for another thing, and then get sent to death row. But I did not get an opportunity to present any kind of mitigating evidence during the penalty phase of my trial. And the reason why is because I, I was in a catch-22 situation. Uh because there were a bunch of the fags at the Marion Federal Penitentiary and wanted to murder me. Uh, I was told in the dream to, con- you know, to confess to this Richmond Heights case. So, you know, I, I, it, was, it had never would have occurred to me, by the way, on my own, to, you know, just to confess to that kind of, you know, it never occurred to me. Luckily, I had that dream that told me to confess to this crime, once I knew that if I got over here and was given just a life, like with the other case in Madison, and I would just be sent back to Marion, where I would be murdered in a matter of days or weeks. So, because I was in, I had to choose between those two alternatives. I chose uh, 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 getting the. Uh, getting a death sentence over here, I knew I would live at least a little longer if I was sentenced to over here than if I went back to the Marion Federal Penitentiary. Right. Hang on. I can't, I can't hear you too well. Are you talking into the phone, or is your battery getting low? No, actually, what it, no, I don't, I, okay, I'll I don't hear matter. you better. Yeah, yeah. What happened was, I'm just, I'm squatting down by the phone booth, Beth. Oh. Right here at the phone cage. Oh, I see. I'm squatting down. And I just got the phone, not in my hands. I just got it in between my shoulder and my chin. I got it. I got it. I and see. It slipped down a little bit. Yeah, I'm glad you. Thanks for letting me know about that. Though. But anyway, I was, you know, pretty much in a catch-22 situation. It was either one, get a life, get life sentence for this, get sent back to Marion, get murdered by a bunch of fags over there, or get sent to death row and take my chances over here. So I chose the latter. You know, I figured I had a better chance. At least I would live a few years longer before I was executed. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, I at that you know, at, at, that gave me no opportunity to present any kind of mitigating evidence. You know, and testify during the penalty phase of the trial. I am convinced right now. I guarantee you that if I had a were allowed to present evidence at a pen, at a at a penalty phase trial got that opportunity for the first time, I, 
I'm pretty sure, 100 percent sure, that a jury would come back after hearing all the evidence with life in prison instead of a death sentence. Well, I'm sure that that issue has been taken up on appeal, hasn't it? I don't think so. Hmm. Uh, I don't believe Jennifer even uh, has, uh, well, she hasn't mentioned that to me. I have never saw it in any brief. Uh, I really wish I had a chance to uh, bring that up with the court. With you know, I wish I'd had a chance to bring it up with the appeals court. And, uh, you know, but Jennifer, for a long time, wouldn't even accept my calls. I couldn't even talk to her or give her any ideas. You know, she's talking to me now since, you know, I've got an execution date that's so close. But well, let me time, ask you about that, because that's like eight days away. Yeah. How, like, are you ready for this? Uh, uh, <laughs> no, I ain't ready for it. No, I'm trying to... I'm doing everything I can to try to avoid it, to tell you the truth. You know, I'd like to try to, I mean, that that helped me out. I mean, Flint getting out there and saying that, that was, you know, I mean, that took a lot of courage to, uh, you know, you got to admit somebody who would have been shot, uh, going to bat for somebody who had shot them. I mean, that was a good thing. Uh, you know, wouldn't you agree with that? Will you say that again? I couldn't understand you. What is that? I said, you know, somebody who got shot like Flint, you know, going to bat, speaking out against the execution of his sh of the shooter, I mean, that, that took a lot of courage, you know. Would you say that? You say um, that? Yes. He's stating he's a, he's a very um, outspoken man. He's very yeah. steadfast in his opinion that um, the death penalty is not an appropriate punishment. Yeah. But I don't know if it would have any effect on a court. He's not the victim in any of your cases. He's not the victim or the victim's family in Missouri. Yeah, not in Missouri, no. But he he was a victim in one case. Yes, but he he wasn't. You weren't prosecuted for that. But he was a victim, and you're saying that you know it. It certainly may carry weight in the court of public opinion, but I don't know about with the Missouri court. Yeah, well, you know, I'm sure they they read it and. I mean, they hear about that on the news themselves, just like sure. anybody else in the public. You know, every Supreme, every justice on the Missouri Supreme Court has probably heard about that, and even the governor of Missouri has probably heard about it. Jay Nixon and the Attorney General Chris Coster, and uh, you know the law enforcement officers in this, you know, who you know, in Richmond Heights, Missouri, probably heard of it, and. Uh, you know, everybody involved in the criminal justice system here probably knows about Flint saying that. And I think it does affect people, you know, and at least makes them stop and think, you know, the, the, the rich people with a whole lot of money uh, can hire these, you know, high-powered lawyers and have them, you know, leave no stone unturned and looking for ways to uh, acquit them or get them off of the light sentence. But a poor man like me... Just doesn't have all that uh, all that clout, and uh, it's usually the, the us poor people who get executed, and not the rich people. You know, it's all about money. You know, the people with the uh, the finances, you know, have as much more advantage than we do. You know. So you met with your lawyer today, right? Uh, I met with a lawyer who was working with the uh, uh, with 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 my team. Yeah, a, mm -hmm. a woman named Jessica. Have you? Have you spoke to her yet? No, I have not. I didn't know her name. Yeah. Do you, do your lawyers think there's a chance of a stay? Uh, well, yeah, I guess so. Or they wouldn't be trying to work on it. You 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 covered a lot of states. You bought a lot of guns. I mean, yeah. how were you getting money? Robert Banks. You know, How many bank story. robberies were you prosecuted for? Uh, well, I was indicted for seven of them, according to an FBI report I saw. But I was never, uh, I wasn't convicted of any except for the one in Chattanooga, and that's the one I confessed to. Mm -hmm. They just didn't think it would be worth their while to try, invite, you know, indict me or try me for bank robberies when I was facing so many counts of murder as it was, you see mm. what I'm saying? And so the bombings they never attempted to try me for. If it had been just the bombings, they would have tried to 
convict me of them. If it had been just the bank, you know, just the bank holdups, they would have tried to convict me of those. You know, they ain't gonna let anybody get away with robbing a bank. You know what I mean? So, what what, what did you bomb? I forgot. I bombed a synagogue in Chattanooga. I bombed the the house of uh, Morris Imate in Maryland, and I bombed a. I put a pipe bomb in the Socialist Workers Party bookstore. That one, that was the first one I started out with. I bombed a black nightclub in Jackson, Mississippi, and I put a pipe bomb on the front on the door of a synagogue in Kansas City. And I was surprised how much publicity that case got. You know, it was during the summer of '78, and uh, it was a pretty big pipe bomb. Too, I was, I had the bomb, you know, hooked up with a. a little fuse, and I had a cigarette. Uh, I timed exactly how how long a cigarette, it would take a cigarette to burn an inch, you know, and so I took the cigarette and stuck it onto the fuse and put it in the shoebox and walked over to the synagogue with it while it was lit. That cigarette was lit. You hear me? Oh, my God. Man, that was dangerous. That would have went off while I was carrying it. Man. What year was that? 1978. Man, that was a dangerous thing to do. I, I set it very carefully by the door of the synagogue and walked back to my car, started it, and drove off. I heard later that people in the neighborhood had heard the explosion. It was so loud. I was surprised that it made the nightly news the next day. It was on the news in the, on the TV and on the, in the newspapers. And they were talking about, oh, we haven't really had any Nazi activity in this city. You know, I guess there wasn't very many members of the American Nazi Party living there. Well, how but, how did you pick your targets, either to bomb or the people, b- besides Vernon Jordan and Larry Flint? But how did you pick all these other people who weren't famous public figures? Uh, well, just just uh, by chance, you know, just just happened to encounter them someplace. I figured that I could just consider them enemies of the white race. And, you know, it's pretty much open season on them. I didn't really look at them as human beings. You know, I was just had been so indoctrinated with Nazi uh, literature. Uh, it's kind of it's how would you decide when to kill, though? Like, did you say tonight I'm going out to kill? something like that. I was just always on the lookout for a target. Well, the whole three years I was on my mission, there wasn't any time when I wasn't looking out for a target. But it's... it's Joseph, it's not, a, it's not like you were using a little concealed weapon. You were using these long distance, you know, these big guns, with long yeah, guns, right, to yeah. shoot long distance. So, I mean, if you're always looking for a target, you had to have some preparation because you had to be able to hide yourself somewhere and pull out a big gold gun. That's a lot of what? And you, you had to, you had to, a lot of planning. I mean, you had to think about it. You had to find a place. You had to, I mean, it wasn't just you're always on, I mean, it can't be you were just always on the lookout because these, you, you were scoping out places and you were hiding guns and you were pulling out these really long guns that you can't walk down the street with easily. Yeah, well, that's the thing, you know, prior to that, I'd never heard of anybody actually taking rifles inside of a, a, a big city and shooting people with it, or at least doing it and, get, and not getting away with it, and not and getting away with it, but it, it just takes, you know, uh, I wasn't actually going out there just shooting at people at random. If I had been just, you know, interested in just killing people, you know, just for the sake of it at random, you know, no matter who it was, it would have been a whole lot easier, you know, like one of those creeps that would go into like that movie theater out there and, and shoot and kill a little four-year-old girl. You know, that guy who's open fire on all those people in that theater a while back. Do you remember reading about that? Yes. Yeah. You know, that kind of crap makes me sick. I would have shot somebody like that if I'd have known he was he'd planning to do something like that. I just considered myself like a vigilante, you know. 
and was out to get the people who were committing most of the crimes, who I thought were the blacks, who were uh, committing miscegenation, which I felt was was genocide of the white race. You know, if I'd have encountered anybody like that guy or those guys, those creeps who at Columbia High School in Colorado, I'd have wasted them in a New York minute. You know, because I would have considered them in the same category as the uh, the mixed race couples and the blacks who go around raping and murdering white people. Mm-hmm. You know, they would have been the same in the same category as far as I'm concerned. I would have I would have shot them without in a heartbeat. Mm. You know, if I'd have known what they were planning on doing uh, in advance. So, uh, you know, I just that was the type of thing I was in. It's kind of a law law and order type. You know, in my warped thinking, I was, you know. Uh, basically felt that I was just on the side of the law, you know, and I was into vigilant, being a vigilante, doing what the police officers were not doing and should have been doing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, believe it or not, I actually, when I was really bored growing up, I always wanted to be a police officer, you know, like my uncle, uh, Rudy Rudolph, was a mobile police officer for years, back during the 50s. You know, his, uh, I would wear his police hat when I was a little toddler and mm. his uh, shirt with the emblem on the, uh, the patch and stuff on the sleeves. And I remember the shirt was so big on me when I put it on, it would hang down on the floor. You know, the shirt tail would hang down on the floor behind me, you know. And I would wear this little plastic gun and holster uh, that my, you know, parents bought me. I would pretend like I was a police officer, you know. So I grew up wanting to be a police officer my whole life. And mm. when I turned 17, my mother told me she had been talking to one of the local police officers there in our neighborhood, and he told her somebody who's blind in one eye cannot be a police officer. It was You had to pass the physical, and that would make me ineligible to be a cop. So that pretty much changed my life. Mm. And so, you know. So are you actually blind in one eye? Well, yeah, I was legally blind. Uh, you know, I injured uh, when I was seven years old. Uh, me and my brother were playing in, in front of our front yard when we lived in New Orleans. You know, my family moved over there. Uh, my sister Carolyn was born in New Orleans, by the way, mm-hmm. back in 1948. You know, the rest of us were all born in Mobile. But we were pulling this spring out of a shade that had two sticks attached to the end of it. And my brother pulled his end, and I pulled mine, and he released his end, and it spun right toward me and hit me right in my right eye. <sighs> you know, I was seven years old, and I could just see nothing but red in that eye. I ran crying to my mother. I was sent to Charity Hospital, you know, for about a week or so. And I remember being in the hospital. It was a little, like a little dormitory with some other other little boys in there. And the doctor, you know, I remember him telling us, telling, saying, be sure and bring him back for this operation. I, the, the cataract had formed on the eye, and had they been allowed to take it off, I would have been able to see out of it. And the doctor... I mean, he, he emphasized and repeated that to my mother. I still remember that when I was just seven years old. Bring him back so we can do this. Then the irresponsible person that she was, she never brought me back to the hospital. So I've had the cataract in my eye ever since. I actually went to an ophthalmologist uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, back in the mid-'70s and asked him about that, said, could this cataract be taken off? You know, could you remove the cataract? Would I be able to see out of my eye again? He said, well, that you probably could, but since it's been on there so many years, you would probably have double vision, so I would recommend you not, you know, against having the operation, you know, unless something happened to the other one, because, you know... He said something, I probably have double vision. So. So, so because of the cataract and the injury huh? at seven, because of the cataract and the injury at seven, you've le- yeah. you're legally blind in your right eye, yet yeah. you were an incredible marksman. Yeah, no, 
with your left eye. Yeah, it's kind of, wow, you know, I could not even fire a bolt-action rifle because, you know, they have the, uh, the action is on, on the right side. I could not, you know, line my eye up right out to look through it, through the scope with a, with a regular-type rifle. I had to use either basically just a, slide, a pump shotgun or a pump rifle or a lever action like the which is for the left side? So you squeeze, your, yeah, you close yeah. your right eye anyway, so you just yeah, need the one yeah. eye. Got it. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, would, I would just kind of lean over it with my left eye. Got it. And work the action with my left hand, just like a left hand person does. You Got know? it. Okay, there, now I understand. There was some, yeah, so, you know, I, I got pretty good at it just through practice. That, that's, that's basically how it happened. I'm kind of slow at learning, but once I learn something, I'm, I'm usually 